Hey, everybody. Uh, almost forgot to turn the lights on. Welcome to another live stream episode of Talking Time Pieces. I even have my power cable plugged into my laptop this week. Um, I'm really, really uh, pleased about the interest in this episode. I even got a question upstream from uh, Taylor Jennings on the issue because last week's live stream, uh, the whole issue of in-house movements and uh, Tudor and Rolex and other companies uh, came up. So I thought, let me do a little bit of uh, due diligence and get some answers and come back with a much more intelligent um, presentation on the issue of uh, in-house movements. But first we have to decide on what an in-house movement is. Um, drinking Beck's Unfiltered uh, tonight. Like I said, I hope you can f buy it where you live because this really isn't bad for a uh, mainstream beer. And I paid for it myself. Uh, no endorsements, but I would take a case of uh, free beer, Bex. I'd even tell everybody, no stress. But um, let's talk about the issue, right? Hey, Jason. Jason Hopeful, how's it going? Uh, greetings and long life. And so let's talk a little bit about what do you think makes an in-house movement? Is it that the movement manufacturer is vertically integrated with the case manufacturer and face manufacturer and bracelet? In other words, all of the aspects of the watch are all of the aspects of the watch made by one company? one set of hands, one umbrella of ownership. Those are all very important uh, distinctions because, for example, um, Rolex, let's start with the uh, king, the number one brand, right? Let's genuflect in the direction of um, St. Petersburg before we move on. And it was a long time where Rolex just owned the company that made their movements. It wasn't part, or I shouldn't even say owned. I think they were a major stockholder. Or I'm not going to go as far as to say I know the previous history, but I do know that Egler was eventually bought and integrated completely with into Rolex. But even in the days when they were just a customer, they had Rolex prominently displayed on the outside of the Egler facility. So um, in-house has been a muddied term from the very beginning. I would personally like to think that uh, an in-house movement, a true in-house movement is a completely vertical operation. The same people, okay, it could be multiple sets of hands and it could be multiple um, divisions, all right? But at the end of the day, the people who, M made the watch if the pe if all of the people involved are all involved in the same organization at the present time with the way the world is globalized and the supply chain goes and it's even the people who are com almost completely in house no almost none of them make hairsprings for example so because they're buying their hairsprings but 99% of their watch is made in house does that make it a not in house movement um if it's 20% I would say it's not the the I believe the Swiss government lays the exact thing somewhere around 55, 60 percent Swiss origin to be considered a uh, manufacturer, as it were. But first, you have to think to yourself, what does an in-house movement mean to you before you have to uh, think about how it applies? And then the second aspect of that is. Um, is it important, right? is the uh, fact that is it is an in-house movement, that it is a vertical organization that manufactured this watch. How important is that to you? Uh, let's see. Uh, Jason, would I consider Hamilton H lineup of movements in-house? Well, that goes directly into the question I'm trying to get us all to frame in our minds of what is in-house and how important is in-house? Now, uh, Hamilton is a Swatch Group company and Etta is a Swatch Group company. And those are 
movements, even if they originated as ETA, they were purchased, well, I shouldn't say even purchased, they were assigned within the group. I mean, obviously, there's money changing hands, even within a vertical corporation, uh, accounting follows where the inventory goes and the resources go within the organization and build the various divisions accordingly. So uh, one could make the argument that a Hamilton is a 100% in-house movement because Hamilton and the movement company are owned by the same organization and that Hamilton actually had a voice in how that movement was tailored for their watch, I would say falls under at least a broad definition of vertical integration because they didn't just get it off the shelf and have to take it themselves and take what they got and maybe get a decorated rotor out of it. Um, a lot of these movements are not just decorated differently for the companies. They are tailored for the specific desires of that organization. Like, for example, in the case of the Tissot Powermatic 80, uh, there's the Powermatic 80 with the um, swatch equivalent of uh, the non-magnetic hairspring technology that's not silicon, uh, nevachrome or whatever. I forget the exact uh, term off the top of my head. But um, a lot of watches are modified, the movements, a lot of the movements are modified uh, within the Swatch Group for the various brands. So you can make a very strong argument that by today's terms, uh, any Swatch Group watch has an in-house movement um, if that movement has been modified to the needs of that brand's um, desires. So, I mean, and I realize that's a broad application, but let's look at something that came up indirectly uh, last week and which prompted this conversation and uh, Taylor asked before the conversation even started, what about Tudor? Because there's a lot going on about how Tudor's in-house movements are not in-house. Now, um, Tudor's movements are made by a company called Kinesi. And the reason that a lot of people are talking about Kinesi in conjunction with uh, Chanel is Chanel owns 20% of Kinesi. But Tudor... <clears throat> created Kinesi and Tudor is the major shareholder in Kinesi and Kinesi was created by the Rolex group Tudor to make movements for Tudor. So intent ownership is there to say that Kinesi movements are arguably in-house Tudor movements by the modern definition of the term that the people who make the movement are owned by the people who make the watch who are owned uh, by the group that sells it. Um, so it all falls together in that integrated sense. And Kinesi was created by Tudor and is majority owned by Tudor. Chanel just wanted in on the action because Chanel is, I put them in the same group as companies like Mont Blanc and companies like Leica. Now Leica's got a watch, not a bad one either. But they're going to have to, you know, earn some lumps in the industry before they start getting some serious respect. How long will they last on the road? How durable are the finishes, the materials? How do they put it together? How well does it wear? Um, Leica is going to have to go through the same barrel that uh, barrel time that a lot of companies went through. And Chanel, they've been trying to establish themselves as a serious watch company for a long time. And so by hooking up with Kinesi, Chanel's got access to high-end uh, movement manufacture. And in the case of, uh, oh, hey, Jonathan Robinson. Hi, everybody. Um, and, uh, oh, hey, and Mike, Mike, how's it going? So, so in the case of uh, Tudor and Kinesi, I think, yeah, by the modern definition of the term, Tudor is an in-house movement because they do own the majority own the company that makes the movements and it was and the company was created to serve their needs so it falls under what i would consider a vertical integration as well and chanel uh just wants to get in on some of that good good manufacture action get some respect just like uh when mont blanc got their hands on minerva they were lucky to have been gifted minerva and when you think about it the the, the movement that uh kinesi makes for breitling and tudor the joint design collaboration is 
the only way you're going to survive in today's world under any circumstances. Uh, I do believe that the individual watch companies should have more independent ownership, but I have no problems with collaboration amongst companies within a, a larger org. If, they're gonna, if you're going to be forced to work under the same corporate umbrella, take the uh, advantages of having that corporate umbrella as well. Um, you know, you can't have it both ways. Either Swatch is an integrator like General Motors and a Pontiac has an in-house engine, even if it's a Chevy small block, because GM owns both companies. Actually, uh, Pontiac, uh, the dear departed, uh, doesn't exist anymore. But um, <clears throat> when, you talk, when you talk about it in those uh, terms, yeah, if it's an integrator, if the company is integrated like Swatch is. They have divisions. The brands are divisions, but um, I would, yeah, I would, I would put it along the lines of General Motors in their heyday. Today, well, today General Motors is still an international conglomerate that manufactures cars on every continent. Um, but the Swiss watch industry is uh, very secluded in comparison. So when you think about um, truly Swiss manufactured watches, right, by Swiss government terms, right? So they're majority Swiss monetary value in country. And then you link it to the companies that want to have their own manufacture because of uh, pride or history or uh, innovative technology or whatever reason, you know, companies that range from Rolex to... Uh, Frederick Constant <clears throat> to Nomos, you know, um, there are companies that are completely, I mean, and Omega is part of the Swatch group. So, you know, uh, those um, silicon hairsprings that Omega is getting are the same silicon hairsprings that um, Tissot is getting for the, uh, the Tissot Silicium, the gentleman Silicium. So, which is just silicon in German. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> organizational integration to make a watch is not a sin. Um, now, companies that just buy movements and slap them into watches are not, you know, are a totally different issue. Um, I, I'm starting to think that uh, some of the companies that say that they go over the Chinese movements that they put into their watches. Um, I'm not going to name any names specifically, but I've had some watches in my hands recently that I had thought the company had gone over, but actually didn't perform as well as a watch that I could have probably regulated myself over a period of time, not being a very good watchmaker, not being a watchmaker at all. But I do know how to push um, a, a lever on a hairspring back and forth with a toothpick. And I have a time grapher. So um, if you're going to sell watches with someone else's movement in them, you should at least take the time, trouble, and ener effort and energy to make sure that they're the best iteration of that movement that comes off the shelf. And if you can, uh, and if it is not an exemplary presentation of that movement, then what value add are you giving besides a pretty case? And if it is just a pretty case, then you should just say, hey, we're, we make a pretty case and price your watches accordingly. Um, but some of the companies that are uh, doing this are charging premiums as if they're putting a value add on these movements that they're getting from third parties and they're not doing anything to these movements from third parties except making sure that they're running and uh, possibly tightening any loose screws they come across, hopefully. But um, yeah, if, if it's an integrated organization and they're actually working with the designers of the watch and the movement is made to their specifications and it's the same organization, I would say that it's an in-house movement. Um, and then there are the companies that use external movements and work on them, like IWC, is not uh, a Swatch Group company. Uh, actually, they're moving towards Salida movements because, uh, well, actually, so there's nothing wrong with Salida movements. They're 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 
patents ran out on uh, very, very good movement designs and there's nothing wrong with using an expired patent. That's why patents are designed to expire so that they can promote uh, development within the industry. Because the thing is, is that companies like Salita that have these original value and ETA base calibers to work with, once they learn movement manufacture themselves and get better at it, they'll start releasing more of their own designs. And we're, we're already starting to see that. So having these companies that are founded on out of patent uh, ETA movements, nothing wrong with that at all, in my humble opinion. I, the, it's just that they should say that these movements are not their movements, that they bought them from Salida or they bought them from, say, for example, even Citizens People or Seiko. Um, there's nothing wrong with having an, an external out of house movement in your watch. Uh, that was the rage in the uh, 60s and 70s before the courts wars. A lot of companies, all they did were pick their choice of case and face and movement out of a catalog to spin it the way they wanted the watch to look. And then they sold it to the industry and the industry bought it. That's how Hoyer started. That's how Rolex started. That's how everybody started pretty much with the exception Oh, pardon me. With the exception of the great houses that started from their own designers' sweat and effort, like Omega, um, like Breguet, like Vacheron Constantin, um, you know, the companies whose names, their founders' names are attached to horological history. Jeje Lecote invented the uh, micrometer. He made the first commercial micrometer to make sure that he could measure uh, a micron in watchmaking. The most accurate watches are, also have the tightest tolerances. You can't make an accurate tool if it has big gaps in its machinery. You have to make sure that the parts are moving as closely together as mechanically feasibly possible in order to have the highest operational functionality, you know, and precision. And precision and accuracy are two completely different things. I have, a, I think I did a whole video on that. I think I might have to do a YouTube short on that. But um, precision is how, to, to use a gun analogy, precision is how um, tight your shot group is. Accuracy is where you put it. But there's nothing wrong with having an out of uh, company movement in your watch if you take the care to make sure that it's integrated into your watch properly and well. Um, and there are a lot of companies that do that. And then there's the whole aspect, and I talked about it a little bit last week, about how quartz, I mean, quartz is obsolete as a time technology, all right? I, I was just at a room full, I was just in a room full of obsolete laboratory-grade rack mount Patek Philippe master timers that used to run governments and factories and train stations and airports, and they're obsolete now because of uh, GPS and atomic clock timing in the grid. So um, quartz watches are as obsolete as mechanical watches. Uh, they're slightly less obsolete than mechanical watches because a quartz watch can be made smart. You can add electronics to it. And um, also they're more rugged. But if you think about it, a uh, quartz watch is an anachronism today. It's just as unnecessary as a mechanical watch today because that uh, smartwatch is based on internet timing. There are internal electronics that can maintain the time when the uh, connection to the internet is lost, but there's no temperature controlled crystal oscillator can inside that Apple watch making sure it tells the accurate time. Quartz watches are as obsolete as uh, mechanical. Oh, I shouldn't say as obsolete because I, I was, as I was saying, quartz does have an advantage in some of the areas of uh, ruggedness and the ability to be integrated into other advanced electronics. But then again, the Accutron can be integrated into advanced electronics. So maybe we should bring the Accutron back. Uh, hey, um, Jason, so prod makes nice Swiss movements. A lot of companies make nice Swiss movements that go under the radar. There, and, and or even look at somebody like um, Eterna. Okay, now that they've been purchased, but up, think about how Eterna slogged on and slogged on and slogged on. Look at me, I'm making great Swiss watches, and nobody paid attention. And Eterna got wound up getting bought. 
you know, there are a lot of good watchmakers everywhere, actually. Not, I mean, there are good watchmakers in America. But I mean, if you think about um, like in-house, theoretically, the uh, Swatch System 51, right? The Swatch System 51 should then be the, 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 the pinnacle of watches because this is such an in-house movement. Human hands didn't even touch it while it was made. Everything, you know, boom, 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 all put together. And um, the Swatch Group is a vertically inter integrated company. They have companies that uh, make crystal oscillators and they have they own companies, Renata Batteries, that make the batteries. So everything in this, um, mostly everything in this I can think of is a Swatch uh, company menu, uh, product. Or like I said, going back to uh, Rolex, right? It wasn't until modern times that they integrated their uh, movement manufacturer into the company. So theoretically, Rolex was using third-party movements because they didn't own Aigler, you know? Now, think about Frédéric Constant. They're doing really, really amazing things, making very affordable, very complicated, beautiful, beautifully decorated, machine decorated. They're using as much manufa uh, machine manufacturing as they can to uh, come out with a really good piece. So uh, what's what's wrong with um, Tissot using the latest in the System 51 technology that made the Swatch versus um, the highly machine finished Frederic Constant, which is arguably, the, this is the best world timer under $5,000 you're gonna find. Literally, it's, I mean, and I'm thinking about getting the uh, Gerard Perigo WWTC, and even that uses an external knob for the city wheel, but then that's also a chronograph, uh, so um, it throws in an extra complication and a busy complication at that. And oh yeah, speaking of the PRX, those of you who didn't know, when I was in New York, I was able to finally get my hands on one. This was literally the last one in the shop, and they had been holding it for me, and they put it out. Uh, for sale the morning I walked in and they were so relieved that I was able to get it because I w was in New York on my way to San Francisco for a con well San Jose for a conference through San Francisco and then I flew back so on my way out I'd stopped at the Tiso shop looking for this found the white face if you look on uh, my Instagram feed you'll see pictures of that and um, I asked about the blue face and it hadn't even come out yet and it was supposed to come out on the 18th and so I walk in the morning of the 18th and they had sold out everything they had in stock. And um, I managed to literally snag this as they were putting it out on display as the last unit. But um, I consider this an in-house. It's a, it's a value in here, which is an ETA. And Tiso's owned by Swatch. And this literally represents the pinnacle of Swatch Group's manufacturing technology, which is why the PRX and the regular PRX are challenging the industry right now because they're providing watches. This watch would have cost $5,000 10 years ago in order to give the owner this value. And in the present day, the closest watches that can come to it are closer to you know several hundred bucks over. Not a lot much more expensive, but still significantly more expensive than this piece. And especially considering what you're getting, this is the better piece. But let's look at something like this uh, Mito, right? This is a this is a net of movement in this thing. This is just a legitimate, uh, uh, theoretically an in-house as a, a seam, well, Omega is much more vertically integrated in a, a movement manufacturer, but still owned by Swatch, right? But this, this Mito Diver, right? It's got an ETA in it. And um, it's not, in this in the case of this Mito, it's not specifically made to Mito specifications, but um, I doubt that they gave them a substandard model to use in their 200 meter diver. So in one sense, it's a gray area, but in another sense, you just follow the money. If, if, if all the money is kept by one set of hands, unless they're just a holding company like uh, poor Breitling right now. But then again, the, the, the holding company's letting Breitling do a lot of cool stuff. Breitling's put out some really, really beautiful pieces. If they came out with that uh, 
moon phase calendar of theirs um, in any other color than salmon, I'd really seriously consider getting one myself. Currently, the winner in for me for price value is the Longines uh, moon phase calendar, but Brightlink could convince me to jump over and add 2,000, no, more than that. The Longines is worth about three and a half. The Brightling would be worth about nine and a half. So I would literally have to triple the cost to jump up to that watch and then you have to go back into is it worth three times the money and the long jeans is a great piece and in that case Etta makes them a special movement it's a value 7751 base 7750 base 7751 is um the gmt if i'm not mistaken but i think but it's a value 7750 base movement but it gets a column wheel so uh, my long jeans chronograph uh, complete calendar moon phase has a column wheel chronograph in it for three and a half thousand bucks. And yeah, you'd have to spend six to 10K to get a watch with that, you know, feature set. And I would say it's an in-house movement in that Longines. It was made for it by a division within the company that owns it. You know, so um, what are your thoughts on that? I'd really like to know. I mean, and it's a subject that we all have a valid opinion on because it's a market and we all have our money and we're all willing to spend it. Right. So your opinion is just as valid as mine. I'm not some, you know, arbiter sitting on my throne decreeing what is watch reality. No, no, I'm just a, a person just like you. I'm just a schlub who uh, I'm a journalist in my day job. So I journalize my hobby. And um, I love advanced tech. And with, check out electronicdesign.com. That's my uh, day job. And uh, I'm just spouting my opinion on watches. So your opinion on what makes an in-house movement is just as valid as mine. So I'd love to hear it. So, hey, Queef Connoisseur, the pleasure is mine. I mean, like I said, it's an important topic to talk about. Um. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, Mike, Mike, Tudor's movements are made by Kinesi. I said that a little earlier, and Chanel has a 20% stake. And uh, Norquain, Norquain is also getting Kinesi movements. And so I could easily see Bell and Ross getting it, because Kinesi is the new hotness, right? It's like having a Dubois de Pra module on top of your ETA, you know, to make your chrono. So at least people don't sneer that it's a modular movement. But in the case of a straight up, because that's the thing about Kinesi, their movements are integrated. They make some really nice movements. But then they're making them for the Tudor Black Bay Chrono. They're making them for the uh, Breitling BR1, B, B1. Um, but they're making them for some heavy, heavy hitters. So everybody wants to get in on the bandwagon, right? Because, you know, Agler's not going to sell their movements to anybody, Right. So um, it really is. That's why I was saying about collaboration being important in the modern world. I don't think the companies all have to be owned by the same umbrella company to work together. Uh, I think if they gave these companies more individual freedom, we'd see some cool watches. I mean, look at poor Longines. They make some really valuable pieces for the money. Imagine if they weren't forced to run in their lane and were allowed to challenge Omega or Blancpain. Longines has got the history and the chops, you know, why couldn't they make a nice $8,000 chrono moon phase, anything GMT pick the complication. <clears throat> I mean, that's the biggest problem with being in a group. Omega can't challenge the people above it on the ladder. The people below it on the ladder can't Mito can't move. Longines, they 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 have to stay in their lane. So they gain from being part of a group, but they also lose individuality. That's why Breitling is doing such a great job right now because they're owned by people who they don't care, uh, which is actually sometimes good. In this case, it is. Um, they're not owned by a watch group. They're owned by some venture capitalists or a holding company or something along those lines. But they're not. They're currently owned by money people, which normally would terrify the average person. Um, 
but in this case, it allows Breitling to do more creative things because there's no one else in the group that they have to step on their toes on. You know, no one's getting their shins kicked under the board table if Breitling decides to put out a watch that challenges watches above it in the food chain, as it were, like that gorgeous salmon. I could probably, maybe I'll get my, you know, maybe I'll start liking salmon. I don't know. Um, cause that really is a beautiful, I think, I think that Breitling, uh, the salmon Breitling complete calendar moon phase gives the JLC a run for its money. The JLC is thinner and, and more elegant, but if you look at them, they're both beautiful pieces and you don't see that the Breitling is less, lesser of, of a poor quality. The Breitling looks sportier, but it's from a sportier company. But it's not like you look at it and you go, oh my goodness, look at the print on this Breitling versus the print on this JLC or the finishing or the applied markers or any of that other stuff. The Breitling punches above its weight. Well, actually, considering it's at the same price point, pretty much, I think the JLC is what, 12 or 13. It's not that much more expensive. So the Breitling should, should challenge the JLC when it comes to quality. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, Mantis Shadow. Greetings in long life. Oh my goodness. Yes, yes, yes. Um, Mantis Shadow says, Good day, Alex. Do I know of have an opinion about the revived Swiss watch brand Nevada Grinchen? I absolutely adore the look of Nevada's uh, Super Antarctic. I was actually, uh, I had my hands on a, on a vintage Nevada Grinchen uh, GMT. I wish I had done an episode on it, but it passed through my hands so quickly that... Um, I didn't think about it at the time. And uh, Nevada Grinchen has a really good history. And I think the people who are reviving the brand are putting in the homework. They're taking their time to <clears throat> make watches just as interestingly tooly as the original Nevada Grinchen. Um, I mean, the Nevada Grinchen GMT had a checkered GMT, checker painted GMT, uh, arm because it didn't even have an end to the hand so it was but it was all interestingly painted um nevada grinchen made some really good pieces that made you look twice when you looked at them and the new nevada grinchen is doing that um if my, if my co collection gets larger uh i might add to it but i must admit because of the economy i've decided to focus on the attainables uh the two thousand dollar to three thousand dollar pieces so that's why i just picked up a oh, wristwatch check i just got this in yesterday i bought it on chrono 24 this is the um marie lacroix gmt icon gmt because it had come up in a lot in conversation and i had said some things about the main the, you know the base model that people might have taken as me bashing it it was more that i thought it was trying too hard to be an ap lookalike and the thing I I really like, I like it more than I thought I would, which makes me feel very good about it. Um, what I really like about it is the numbers in the bezel give the big clunky bezel a reason to be there. So um, it really, you know, makes the icon a real sports watch, in my opinion, because it's a very functional uh, complication GMT. And it has this big grippy bezel to begin with. So putting the numbers on it made it functional. Now I am going to, I am going to complain. It's a unidirectional bezel and I have a couple of other small, uh, nigglings about it that I will bring up in the review. But as far as I'm concerned for, um, about 1900, uh, used in good quality, um, this is a great sports watch and um, again, a good example of uh, what you can do when you're, when you're trying to make something nice at a specific price point. So this is a really good watch, but you can see the, some of the places where they um, tried to save money in order to make it a, an, an affordable price point for the watch, like using a diver bezel instead of a um, GMT bezel, which should go in both directions. You know, little things like that. But uh, yeah, because I'm focusing on these, you know, 1900 and also 1900 or so given taxes. And I did 
score a uh, moon swatch when I was in New York as well. So um, I'm I'm loading up on some really nice pieces to do shows on because I also have the uh, Longines Spirit GMT. Um, well, it's been back ordered. That's why I don't have it yet. And I've got the uh, Seiko uh, GMT on order. And I just I did finally find a fairer um, flyback split second chronograph with a color scheme that I liked. And, uh, and so I ordered that as well. And that's coming in next week. So we're going to have a lot of really nice pieces, um, on the show in the coming months. So I encourage you to tell your friends to subscribe and please like this show. If you uh, haven't, because it really does matter to the metrics and tell your friends to subscribe too, please. And tell them we're going to be reviewing some really cool watches. Cause I haven't reviewed the, um, Mito yet. And I haven't reviewed the Tiso yet. And I haven't done really, well, I mean, everybody's talked the Roly 41 to death, but I haven't, I'm going to do a comparison against the Globemaster because I think it's a valid comparison. And then I got the episode where I smash the three fake Rolex is coming up as well. So we have a lot of really cool content coming up. So please tell your friends about it. We're a little bit more than halfway through the show, so if you have any questions, now's a great time to bring them up. Otherwise, I'll pop over to the um, site page and see what kind of questions we have coming over through the mailbox. But let's look at the inbox here for now. Um, <clears throat> Mantis Shadow also says, if possible, I would love to see a review of the Super Antarctica or the Stoa Marine. Stoa makes some nice pieces. Um, I wouldn't do a 36 millimeter watch unless I knew I could sell it because if I had to keep it, I, I'm, I'm a, my hands are a little too big. This is a, this is like a 43 and it doesn't look all that big on my hand A 36, unless I'm wearing a suit, I'll wear a 36 with a suit. Um, but I, I, I might get my hand, I might buy, I might buy a Nevada Grinchin. I might buy one. Um, if I can find one at a good price, uh, in one of the, one of the styles that I like, I might make the leap because if I can't move it on, then I'd be happy keeping it, which is what I do with all of my pieces. I don't review a piece unless I would actually uh, buy it for myself to keep myself because I'm not in this as a dealer. So if I can't, you know, move the watch on, I don't even try to make a profit, but if I can't move the watch on, I'm stuck with it. And I don't say stuck with it because if I buy it because I like it, then at least I'm not stuck with it. And then you always get a good review because these are all watches that I would, my, I would put on my wrist myself. So, um, Jason, Jason, um, oh, we got a siren going by in the background. <clears throat> Jason says, I have an opportunity to buy a brand new Mito Multifort Chrono for 850 Canadian. If you like the way it looks, it's a good watch and that's a decent price for it. Go for it. I paid 18 for my Chrono. It retails for around two. Um, 850 is a good price for the Mito Multiport. Um, I would, it's, it, it's a good value. So if you like the way it looks on your wrist, put it on your wrist, though. If you have an opportunity to touch it, um, try not to buy a watch unless you've at least seen it through a shop window in the flesh. Photographs do not do anything proper justice, especially when you're going to drop a couple thousand dollars or a thousand dollars on something. Let's see. Uh, Milad Sky, greetings and long life. Um, hi, Alex. How about buying a used Submariner as an investment? Depends on how much you can get it for. If you can get that sub for, well, if it has, it all depends. Does it have a box? Does it have papers? Is the bracelet in good shape? There are a million questions. If you're going to buy a sub, can you see the movement? Will the owner go to a jeweler, have the jeweler take the back off the watch and take photographs of the movement so you can verify that it's a free sprung balance and then at least 99% chance of being a real Rolex. So all of those things being equal, I would say, yeah, buy one as an investment. Um, I must admit, I did take a financial loss switching over from my Explorer 2 to the date chest. And you, if you watched any of the episodes about my love-hate relationship with Rolex, I finally at the end decided to go with a very classic Rolex that with box and papers. So that way it's not, it, it, I don't think of it as an investment, but at least I'm not going to lose any money on it. And it was worth the trouble uh, to pick up. And the Explorer uh, 2 that I had picked up, I had managed to get a second generation um, one six five seven zero, 
uh, so no holes in the lugs. It was really a nice piece and was a good value, but it didn't have a factory bracelet, which was a huge handicap that I didn't realize how much it would be a problem because it's very easy to say you wear it on a NATO or put it on rubber. But when it dings the resale value of the watch by $2,000, then it, it with a watch in a that's trading, you know, crazy in a market that's out of you know, it, 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 thankfully the prices are going back to market norms. Uh, I don't mind that they're going down right now. I mean, as long as they're stable, better to be stable in long-term growth than all of the speculative crap. So, um, I have no problem with that at all. So I would say if the, if the, if the Samariner has got at least papers or, uh, and one good way, an easy way to get papers, an expensive, but easy way to get papers. If you send a watch to Rolex, they'll charge you through the nose, but you'll get a new two-year warranty card. I did that with my um, Oyster Quartz. Uh, it cost me 1,700 euros to have that watch serviced, but it allowed me to sell it with papers, and uh, I was able to get market value for the watch where I wouldn't have if I hadn't had it serviced because it was also having a, the date was slipping on it, uh, so it needed service. And I had factored in I didn't realize what cost that much, but I had factored in an expensive service when I bought it uh, and I got it at, a, at a, a discount, but it had no papers. So I had it serviced and you get papers from Rolex if they service it. So if you buy this sub and it has no box, no papers, and you can verify it's real and you get a good deal, that factors in, if it's nothing wrong with that watch, it's going to cost you at least a thousand bucks at Rolex to have it serviced, send it to Rolex to have it serviced, and then you'll get it back in one of those cool little green suede pouches and um, with a brand new warranty card for two years, which even if the warranty runs out, the card is from Rolex and it shows the watch has proper vintage. But yeah, if you can get it with good terms, the market hasn't fallen that much on Rolex. The, the market went down on the crazily speculated ones, the Tiffany and all that other, but a black sub didn't go up that much it's not going to come down that much, you know? Uh, so a, a, a sub, buy it and take good care of it and wear it yourself, you know? Uh, I wouldn't wear it everywhere. I, I, I don't, Frankly, I've gotten to the point where I only wear the date just at trade shows in a suit because unfortunately Rolex effort to go from premium watch brand to luxury watch brand uh, has pushed their watches into the realm of uh, being theft targets. You know, so I would much rather wear my Globemaster someplace because people may not even recognize that it's worth anything or, you know, the Maury Lacroix, because if I'm traveling, better to have a GMT anyway. And this is a perfect watch to travel with because people look at it and they go, oh, yeah, it's an a a AP lookalike and uh, don't cut your arm off for it. But uh, that is unfortunately a problem when you are, you know, a collector and wearer of um, premium and luxury watches. Uh, I'm, I'm going to start using the word premium instead of basic luxury or entry level when I talk about watches because they are all premium watches and uh, then it shoves the luxury stuff up into the realm of luxury where it belongs. But a, a premium company can make a luxury item. I would, I would call a um, Omega DeVille or a Omega Globemaster or an Omega Constellation a luxury watch. I wouldn't call them premium watches. Um, I would call most of what Omega makes, the Seamaster, the Speedmaster, um, the Railmaster, I would call them premium watches. So when you think of Adrian, um, Barkin Jack's Adrian, he, he, he also, uh, he hates to use the word luxury because I can see where he's coming from, but I mean, they are luxury purchases if you know, you don't need them, but I like his, his term, you know, use of the term premium to talk about basic luxury, because then people know exactly what you're talking about, because it is a premium product and uh, premium, a premium product can be luxury. Um, and not all luxury products are premium. <laughs> so, um, shy Robert, I love Farrer. Wow. You're the man. Well, Hey, how's it going by the way, shy? Uh, I I've talked Farrer up a lot. And just like my talking up Mito made me eventually go out and get a Mito because I wanted to put my money where my mouth is and have a Mito to review for the channel. Um, I also like Ferrer. I like 
what they're doing. And I, uh, when I had the realization that Quark's is collectible horology in a serious fashion, I decided, well, what if I were going to add a, a Quartz watch to my collection, and I have a Moon Swatch now, which is a Quartz watch, but I didn't get it for that reason. Um, and I've got a G-Shock embedded in plastic, and that's exactly why I bought it for it, embedded in plastic. But as far as like a Quartz watch that I would actually maybe wear on occasion, and yes, I would wear the Moon Swatch on occasion, but uh, not because it's a Quartz watch. And so I thought the fairer uh, chrono, the, the double chronograph flyback would be perfect. But the one they had initially was very, very uh, interestingly colored. And the one that I wound up buying is more, it still has an uh, interesting pattern on it, but it's more subdued blacks and browns and such. Uh, so I thought, okay, this is a watch I could keep if I can't move it on. And so, yeah, I'm, I put my money where my mouth is and I, bu I bought a fairer, cost about 600 bucks. And um, it should be arriving on Monday. Or Tuesday. So, but I I I, I realize that um, there are some really interesting pieces at reasonable prices. I don't think I'm gonna. Uh, I was actually thinking about getting a glycine SST and uh, um and the uh, some other uh, lower priced uh, watches, but there are en I think there are enough people talking about you know. One hundred and three hundred dollar watches out there, and there are a lot of people, and there are a lot of people talking about twelve thousand and fifteen thousand and twenty thousand dollar watches out there. But there aren't too many people talking about two and three and fifteen hundred, you know, dollar watches, uh, attainable, collectible. That you know, people. I shouldn't say people because there are people who can't afford that. But um, mainstream watch collectors, let's call it that. You know, people who. Uh, they might swing as high as six or seven thousand on a watch, you know, you know, for the top of their collection, but they're 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 banging around in the fifteen hundred to thirty five hundred dollar uh, watch range, wearing Marie Lacroix and wearing Red Rado and wearing some really good companies out there, you know, um, like Mito, you know, like Oris, and so and in fact, I'm I'm that's going to be my next. Uh, mainstream you know premium watch purchases I'm, I'm trying to find an oris that i could uh, fall in love with and i'm thinking about the skeleton uh, big crown pilot 10 pilot x uh, because that's a really striking piece and um i sold my uh tag heuer skeleton carrera 2 chrono so i don't have a big honking skeleton sports watch in my collection right now so if i need a big honking skeleton sports watch to wear for whatever geeky reason i feel like wearing it maybe i'm visiting some facility and i want to you know uh engineer flex in front of people you know engineers and technicians who would actually care about that kind of thing um not to say that there are other people who don't care about that kind of thing but you tend to find more watch geeks among engineers and technicians than you would among, say, for example, um, real estate agents. Although some are very good in watches because they want to show um, their knowledge of various things for conversation purposes or just to show that they're really good at real estate because they can afford some really nice pieces. So let's see. Um, Swatch Group. Shy Robert says, Swatch Group is not hardcore or extreme enough to move the industry forward. Most watch collectors are now going for retro look, except Richard Mill. I used to have a lot of nice things to say about Richard Mill, but I had such a negative experience at their New York boutique that I don't even want, it's not even worth describing just to say that they're, they don't need my support. They're full enough of themselves. They don't need anybody's support or help. They, they, they walk on water in their eyes, I guess. Um, but, uh, shops like that, the only people who walk in are fans and customers and you need the fans or else you won't have customers because without market pressure that these are cool, nobody's going to want to put them on their wrist. So companies like Richard Mill that are, that are, um, negative to curious, curious seekers or fan base or people who just want to walk in their shop and look around, uh, the shops that are hostile to that are, are, are losers, in my opinion, even if they're making money. Um, I was at the Jacob & Co. facility, the their boutique in Manhattan, and their watches are just as expensive as Richard Mills, and they treated me 
very well and were very nice to me, even though they knew that there was no way on God's green earth I was going to walk out uh, with one of their watches. But, you know, they know the only people who walk in are customers and fans. And obviously I didn't have the entourage to be dressed as I was. If I had an entourage, I could probably get away with being rich. But um, they were nice to me anyway, whereas Richard Mill was so cold, it wasn't even, like I said, yeah, I'll, I'll skip over that. But um, the the retro look is coming from the fact that there are some really nice watches that were designed in the past, right? I mean, like, for example, I really, I'm, I'm thinking of getting a Hamilton Intramatic for my collection. Again, $2,000 watch, but a beautiful piece. Um, classic Panda chrono by Compax, right? Beautiful $2,000 watch. And um, I intend to get my hands on one eventually, maybe not right away. I just bought five. Oh my God, I bought that many watches. But I was in New York traveling specifically to shop for them. And I picked up, I don't count this, the Seiko because that was only 500 bucks. And uh, fairer, I had to do it for the channel. So no, I'm not spending too much money on watches. It's, it's for the channel. It's for the audience. That's the rationale I'm giving myself at least. But then again, I am doing it for you as well. I do it for me, obviously. But I enjoy the hobby and I love sharing it with you all. And I love your comments and I love your questions. And I mean, I love you all, period. And if we couldn't have this conversation, this channel wouldn't be nearly as fulfilling for me. So um, the Icon is such a cool watch. I prefer the three-hander though. Well, Mike, Mike, everybody has their taste. I like the GMT because all it does is throw an extra hand on the face, but it gives it just that little bit extra busy, complicated. And like I said, I like the fact that the numbers are on the bezel. It keeps the bezel from looking like uh, uh, um, a uh, AP, you know, I got a big bezel look. It's the bezel's big because it has these numbers for the GMT functionality. You know, I mean, I recognize that, no, they're using the big bezel to put the numbers on, but... It, it, to me, it comes across more balanced. And um, But the three-handers are beautiful piece as well. If you have one, good on you. And if you're thinking of one, go for it. But the Icon the icon as a whole is a, is a nice family. I bought the Tide, the plastic one from the Recycled Ocean Plastic. I did an episode on that. You should check it out. And I gave it to my oldest daughter. She loves it. She she was wearing it when she visited me this last week. And she, does, she didn't do it to humor. She doesn't do stuff like that to humor bees. She... I can tell she genuinely wanted to wear the watch because uh, she was going to see friends afterwards and she wouldn't do stuff to humor me and then go see friends. But uh, she also really loves the, um, I gave her my um, Inox. I gave her my Victorinox Inox watch uh, and she loves that. She That's what she wears to concerts because she jokes she can beat somebody to death with it if they give her a hard time. But it's the kind of watch you don't have to worry about, you know, banging into stuff or anything like that. So, and she wears in her, you know, for day to day, she's got a Casio calculator watch I gave her. She loves it, but, um, I don't, I, I, she, I think she more likes the functionality like, uh, clock and, uh, alarms and such. And the large keypad of the, uh, calculator gives her, you know, easy, easy access to those functions and you can use it as a calculator. So, uh, but going back to, uh, the icon, the Marie, Maurice Lacroix, Icon, it's a great family of pieces. And um, if I were going to go with a non-GMT, I'd go with a Chrono because then it gives, it fills up, you know, it fills up the face. I like, I like Chronos, you know, the, the, the sub dials fill up the face nicely on a big watch. So it doesn't look as big and uh, blank expanse as uh, <clears throat> poorly laid out white space can be. So... Oh, we've got a, just a couple minutes left in the show. If anybody has any last minute questions or comments, uh, we will address them uh, now. Thoughts on, the, oh, Mike, Mike, thoughts on the new Mark 20. IWC is, is, is polishing that stone and it gets shinier every pass. If you want a good, solid, well-made Flieger that screams quality, even though it doesn't have applied indices, pardon me, The IWC, I've owned several, <clears throat> and I'm probably going to wind up 
buying another one eventually because they just they're like moth to a flame they're just such beautiful watches though i might get their gmt next time because i don't know i'm on a gmt run right now i'm going to do a big gmt episode too but um iwc for a watch that is plain it screams quality looking at it i mean people have looked at my iwc i had an iwc flieger chrono um i had a couple of those and people looking at them they commented on them even though there's nothing fancy about them it's just they're so precise the the printing is so crisp the case is just right the balance of the numbers and the proportions like i was watching the id guy uh, a couple of days ago talking about the mark 20 and he went over it chapter and verse i strongly encourage you to check out that uh, episode on the id guy and he pointed out how they made little changes like move the numbers in a couple of millimeters and little things to change the balance of the face and the case the the mark 20 is i don't know what they're going to do you know next change the sword hands back to straight or something but they, they they pretty much reached the top with the, the mark 20 i can't think of anything that they could do to it uh to make it a better watch than it is now. It even has an in-house movement, you know, by the definition of uh, even the reasonably strict observers. So yeah, Mark 20, out of the park. Great watch. Um, the trouble is, is that a clean face three-hander, I've got my JLC Polaris and I don't want I I don't want too much competition for that on my wrist because I'd hate to sell that one and if I wound up wearing it less because because the IWC I would wind up wearing a lot that's a really nice piece but um, I I do like the, the Polaris more so I wouldn't want to get the J I wouldn't want to get a watch that is in such competition to the Polaris as far as like a clean sporty um, three hander. But then again, I've gone back on my predictions of watch purchases before. So let's see. Um, Jonathan Robinson. That's why I didn't pull the uh, trigger on the SIN 556. Just a little too small. Well, <clears throat> that's why I say put the watch on your wrist. Hold it in your hand. At least look at it through the window of a shop because the photos don't do a watch justice. And if you put it on your wrist, you can really get a feel for what you're getting, obviously, because that's as you know close to using it as you're going to get. But um, yeah, it, it and it's all a very personal decision. Some people like small tanks because they want the smallness. They want the, the elegance. It's all up to the individual. That's why I could never criticize someone's watch choices. I could only tell people what I would buy. Let's see. The new Oris Aquas Red is awesome. Oh, and thank you, uh, Milad Sky. Uh, if I didn't say hi earlier, hi. Uh, I appreciate the kind words. And um, I think Oris is another company that, well, they're, they're independent, right? So they're doing interesting and cool things. They were the first to, as far as I know, they were the first to use recycled ocean plastics in their uh, watches. They had that um, line of the divers that had the recycled plastic faces. And they used the fact that it was recycled to give them unique uh, color patterns because they just took the plastics they had and squished them and sliced the faces from that plastic. So Oris, the only niggle I have with Oris, the only problem I have with Oris is I think that they need to up the size of their movements to match the case sizes because they're they, they're they're nice movements but they, they they you flip over some of their watches and it looks like they're drowning in the back of that uh case they should just not put a display back on a watch if the movement is too small in relation to the case to be a reasonably impressive presentation so i'm not saying that they shouldn't use small movements in watches they shouldn't put a display back on a watch with a small movement but 
Oris is a great company and they're making some nice pieces. But and if like I said, if you look at the if you look at the Pro Pilot or the you know the the, the their uh, bigger pieces, some of those movements are huge. So it's not that they don't know how to make big movements. It's just that I think they're 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 uh, using some designs that they probably need to um, shelve or hide or migrate upwards um, because yeah, it, 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 presentation is important today. It really is. And why not upgrade the movement or port the, you have large movements in other watches, port the larger movements over to the watches that are getting bigger, but their movements aren't, you know, that is an issue. Uh, it, it may not be a very big issue to some, but I think it throws off the symmetry of the back. If you flip it over and the movement's not a good balance to the size of the case, but Oris in whole fantastic company. Like I said, I'm really thinking about getting, um, the skeleton pro pilot 10. Because that is a sharp piece. 10-day power reserve. Great engineering in it. Lisbon, Portugal. Jose Luis Oliveira Gonzalez. Hello, hello, my friend. Glad to have you. Unfortunately, uh, we've reached the bottom of the hour. I mean, the top of the hour. Um, let's see. Has any watch been getting more wrist time lately? Um, you've got an Explorer 36. Everyone has their own taste. Smaller watches, uh, if they suit your tastes, go for it. And I'll I'll close on my watch. Uh, I'll close on your last question, Levy, uh, and welcome, Levy, Levy Olson. Uh, has any watch been getting more wrist time lately? Uh, in the two and a half weeks I was in New York, I only had four watches. So, ironically, the one I sold to my uh, brother-in-law was the uh, one I had worn the most because it was the most functional GMT that I had in my collection, the um, Tag Heuer uh, Carrera GMT. Uh, but um, th And this one's also an office GMT, not a traveler GMT. Uh, I do have the Longines Spirit uh, GMT, the Zulu, on order, and that's a true GMT, so I'll have at least one true GMT to travel with. But since I've been back, I've been giving this one a little bit because I just got back and I just got this in the mail uh, yesterday morning. Um, and other than that, I've been playing, I have had fun with the uh, Mito and at, once I bought it, I did play a lot with uh, the Tiso, but there's nothing that's really burning up my wrist right now. It's more that um, I've been having a honeymoon phase with the two or three uh, new pieces I got my hands on in this last trip and the couple that I ordered uh to um, arrive right about now, like I said, I'm I'm waiting on a couple of pieces, including the fairer. So um, I'm a lucky man in the sense I really, really have fun with my pieces, and I don't really even the pieces I really like, I'll deliberately put down so I can put something else on because I want to give that watch a little bit of uh, runtime. So, but uh, as far as pieces go, nothing really been take has been taking up a lot of my time. Um, but that could change going forward. But right now, you know, I'm just having a lot of fun with the new pieces I've picked up. So uh, take care, everybody. Love you all. Live long and prosper. And uh, have a great week until next time. My next episode will probably be a review of the new T Tiso PRX Chrono because that's the hottest one uh, out right now, probably followed then by the Moon Swatch and then the Mito. Uh, and some other stuff, but, um, yeah, keep in, keep tuned, subscribe, please. We've got some really cool content coming. Thanks everybody. Take care.